welcome to at and Threat Track for March 5, 2013. This program provides network security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. I'm joined today by Jim Clausing and Matt Kaiser, and I'm John Hogaboom. So starting off today, we're going to jump into a story that Matt has. Uh, so Matt, apparently there's a, another case of some espionage APT type activity going on. It looks like we've got another one of those AP-style espionage malware out in the wild again. This one is known as Miniduke. It's an espionage malware that was discovered by Kaspersky and Crisis Lab. Originally thought to have been created around 2012. There's new evidence that it's as old as June of 2011. Mostly found in Europe, United States, Middle East, and Brazil. And there's been 59, at least, reported victims so far. Uh, the infection vector for this one is malicious PDFs, which seems to be par for the course. Uh, the topics include for these malicious PDFs Ukraine's foreign policy, uh, NATO membership plans, and information for a bogus human rights seminar. So if that gives you an idea of the kinds of targets, the kind of people that they're looking to spearfish with these emails, um, the initial payload is a 20-kilobyte downloader, which is apparently tailored for each victim system, written in assembly, which is about as close to binary as, as a human being can normally get. So the people writing this are fairly sophisticated. Uh, and it calculates a unique encryption key based on aspects of the victim system and uses that later on in its infection uh, cycle. Now, the next stage, uh, two different styles of command and control, one of which relies on pre, um, pre-configured Twitter accounts, which contain command and control to point to another server. Now, this also has a, there's a backup command and control, which was included in later versions of Miniduke, which instead of using Twitter, if Twitter fails, that is, um, they'll go on to Google and search for particular random-looking strings. Uh, and the uniqueness of these strings, the throw into a Google search, would have led you to backup command and control. Um, I actually tried Googling for some of these strings myself, and I was not able to find any legitimate command and control. But it seems that there's a few other research groups out there that are very aware of it. Uh, the secondary command and control, once that's reached, has commands and further backdoors encoded in obfuscated GIF files. And if anyone format, familiar with the format of GIF, it's an image file. You typically would not see executable code inside of it, but that's what the attackers are hoping that everyone else will think. Uh, the final payload with the espionage functions is a 22-kilobyte DLL file, connects to servers in Panama and Turkey, and the DLL itself is partially encrypted with Again, information specific to the victim machine. Now, if you take that malware and you move it to another machine to try and analyze it, um, that machine's fingerprint will no longer be correct, and the malware won't operate the way you'd like it to. So all in all, a fairly sophisticated piece of malware. Uh, you know, it's, I mean, there's a lot of points that you hit there um, that are uh, – shadows of remembrance for me because I don't know if that's the right term, but PDF as the exploit payload, uh, we've seen that a lot, especially with these ones uh, targeting these types of things, human rights, other government agencies, things like that. Um, and then you mentioned uh, encoding inside GIF files, uh, which I think Shady Rat was another one, maybe not in GIF, but JPEG or something like that. I think they were hiding some stuff in images up on websites. Um, that was the command and control. Uh, so there's a lot of overlap there. Um, now, Twitter, I haven't seen them use Twitter, or at least the groups that I've been aware of. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I would expect that, you know, they evolve over time and find new channels to, to do their command and control. The, the Google aspect is interesting as well. Um, I've often thought that they could use Google as kind of a, since it caches so much stuff, they could almost use search results as long as their stuff gets cached uh, in the Google cache. They could just have, you know, the bot, you know, look up at Google and get a search result and not actually hit a real command of control. They can just look at the, the head of the cache result and, and see what instruction they might need to go from, from there. Uh, so interesting. Uh, uh, thanks for bringing us that story. I, I, you know, we've talked a lot about these types of attacks. Um, highly obfuscated, uh, very difficult to detect on your network. Uh, so uh, what I would say is uh, keep an eye on incoming stuff, particularly email, 
Um, not that that's the only way, but it's one of the primary ways where they send these targeted spearfishes in. They look like they're coming from somebody that you might actually know, uh, but there might be something just slightly off about it, uh, hopefully, that would tip you off to the fact that this is a malicious payload inside this email. Yeah, well, the other piece that makes it really obnoxious is using the that you know encryption key that's calculated per the particular machine. So it makes our jobs as you know malware analysts considerably more difficult because we can't take it to another machine to analyze it. All right, absolutely. So you have to basically analyze it on the infected host um, uh, in some kind of forensic analysis. You can't take it to some other location and try to run it there. Uh, so, yes, yeah, they're evolving and getting more crafty as time goes on here. We know that, you know, there's been a lot of activity around this over the past month uh, trying to thwart some of this type of activity. I don't know if it's the same players involved in this particular case, but um, uh, in terms of being, who's being thwarted. Um, but uh, uh, certainly they're going to get more clever, uh, craftier, and we're going to have to try to keep up with them. So. Um, next story on our docket here is, uh, Jim, you have some information about renting botnets. I think this is something we might have talked about before, but I, I, I think we might have uh, a fresh look at it here. Yeah, we've, we've kind of talked about this on a number of occasions in the past, but uh, uh, there was a blog post on the 28th of February, so just last week, um, on WebRoots threat blog uh, by a fairly well-known researcher, uh, Danko Dankev. I'm not sure if that's how you actually pronounce it. Um, and then it got picked up by some other folks after that. But um, he and they at WebRoot um, discovered an underground service offering uh, botnets for, for rent or for sale. And uh, one of the interesting things that they noted was, was um, the prices vary based on the, the mix of bots that you have available. Um, those that were largely or completely U.S. infected machines uh, yielded the highest price and then, you know, it, EU-type machines, you know, machines in Germany and um, Britain and France, you know, were the, about the next uh, the next tier. And if you had them scattered all over the world, in, you know, that was the ones that actually rented out for the cheapest. And uh, they had some varying ideas of why this might be. Um, you know, one suggestion was, you know, the, U the folks in the U.S. Um, are, you know, the U.S. being the, basically the wealthiest country, the folks infected in the U.S. might have the most buying power, so it might be worth the most to, you know, steal their identities or whatever. Um, I'm thinking part of it may also be that, you know, infected machines in the U.S. might have, you know, better connectivity and bandwidth than, you know, than some other places, although I, uh, we're not necessarily the, always the fastest machines around or the best connected machines, but I think that probably plays into it some too. Um, but it was just interesting that, you know, the, the prices that could be demanded, you know, uh, $1,000 for 10,000 machines in the U.S. Um, versus uh, Six hundred dollars for the ten thousand machines in Germany, Canada, and Britain, or four hundred if it was elsewhere in the EU, or two hundred if it was, you know, a worldwide mix. Just interesting that the a that markets like this exist. I mean, we've we've been aware that the bad guys were selling access to their the, the machines they had captured for quite some time, but. It's interesting to see the, the real prices that they're charging. Yeah, I mean, like you said, they've been doing this for a few years now. And uh, what I actually would find interesting, I don't think anybody's done a report on this, is the economics of 
of botnet rental prices, if they're going up or going down over time, and to kind of trend that. I don't know if that's, you know, there's probably not a large enough sample set of, uh, of uh, you know, vendors out there, so to speak, that offer botnet rental services. But it would be interesting to see over time how the prices have come down. I think it's come down. Um, and uh, when you look at $1,000 for renting 10,000 bots, 10,000 bots is pretty significant. Uh, especially if you tried to use them for a DDoS attack. It depends on what you're going to use them for, but, right. um, uh, you know, that's a significant amount of strength that you could leverage against a particular target if you wanted to, um, you know, do that with your botnet. If you're trying to steal passwords or harvest credentials, that's a different subject. Or try to do um, – uh, oh, it's escaping me when you uh, – uh, uh, you you try to uh, uh, have it visit websites in order to click fraud. Uh, right click fraud. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, so well, it, and you, like you said, for the for the DDoS kind of thing, you want machines that have relatively good sized pipes to to be able to launch a lot. And ten thousand machines in the U.S. on cable modems and DSL and you know fiber. That's a lot of horsepower. Yeah, that was kind of my thought, too, when I read the story, is that it might be more the bandwidth uh, uh, aspect than uh, than anything else in terms of why they're higher priced uh, for a United States-based bot. So, uh, interesting story. Thanks for bringing that to us. Um, and I think you've got another one about um, uh, uh, TrustWave has a new password report out. And I think we've talked about this before, too, but uh, this looks like an interesting story because it's kind of a, a fresh look for the new year to see how, how we're doing in terms of maintaining our passwords. Yeah, I reported on it myself a few times last year. I did some reports on the password guessing that's been hitting one of our honeypots. And then I also analyzed some of the passwords that were uh, used in one of the big breaches last year. But uh, TrustWave's Spider Labs, their research folks, do this annual uh, global security report. And one of the aspects of it is password security. Um, they, one of the services they offer is they do penetration tests. And so in the course of this, they uh, captured about a million unique uh, passwords and did some analysis of them. And you know, for a number of years, um, password, you know, some variation on the word password has been the top uh, password that the users will use. And this year, that is no exception. It was a lot of the same things, password, password one, password with an at sign for the A, or a zero for the O. All variations on that are um, in the top 10 uh, passwords again this year. Uh, people continue to choose relatively poor passwords and um, one of the things that they determined that they commented on in this report was how folks will do the absolute minimum. If you require uppercase, lowercase, and a digit, then they'll have you know, one uppercase and one digit, and then they'll you know, uppercase the first letter and put a digit on the end kind of a thing, um, or you know, tack a one, two, three on the end of it, stuff like that. Um, so they're seeing a lot of the same poor choices that uh, for passwords that people have been making for a long time, and it's. I guess their point is that the that the human being is still the weak link in this. Yeah, absolutely, and. Uh... You know, uh, a funny story or a, a related story to this, I had a family member just last week. I got some email from her that uh, was not really from her, and I could tell uh, uh, what happened there is that her email account up on a, you know, popular email service uh, provider that provides email had been hacked, and I could actually, you know, track back and see it was someone from Hungary or something had connected in 
um, and used her login ID. And she was she, so she asked me, well, how do they do that? How do they get my password? And I said, well, do you have uppercase letters in your password? And she's like, no. I was like, do you have special characters? No. And I said, well, that's it. You know, is it a word? And she said yes. And I said, well, you know, you've got to have strong passwords. And um, if you don't, it's just too easy for these brute force dictionary-based attacks. You know, they have all the time in the world and enough resources. We were talking about renting botnets. They could rent 10,000 bots and have them just start brute forcing trying to log into, you know, such and such website uh, with various login IDs and passwords, and they'll eventually get a few that, that get through. And the easier your password is, the easier it is for them to get into your account. So, um, you know, something to be conscious of. I'm a big fan of passphrases where you can type a big, long sentence in. Uh, the problem with that is that only there's very few websites and services that I use that allow me to put a long passphrase, and I would like to see that get adopted more because I think that makes it really tricky. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. The, the longer that they'll let you put in, the better. On the other hand, you know, if you can't see it as you're typing it in and you fat finger something in the middle, you know, sometimes it can be a real pain to put the long ones in, but I'm I'm with you on that, a hundred percent. Right, right. And we've talked we've talked in on occasion on previous shows about you know what are some of the alternatives, and you know everybody talks about biometrics or you know some other two factor authentication, and and there are places for that. But, you know, my big fear with the biometrics, and I've, I've probably said this on other shows in the past, was, you know, the, if somebody can grab whatever the encoded version of your fingerprint or retina scan or whatever, and you can't change that. You know, I, I, I can't change my fingerprint. Right. So that, that's what scares me about going to biometrics, at least with passwords, if it gets broken, I can change it. Um, but if if my biometrics, if somebody happens to steal however that's encoded that gets sent to the authentication server, I can't change my fingerprint. I can't, you know, change my retina scan. So. Yeah, well, you've got you got ten passwords, right? You've got one for each finger. You just keep rotating around, and yeah. then you go to your toes. And you yeah, can start yeah. using your toe print. Start using a different, yeah, different finger, a different eye. <laughs> but, no, that's a really good point that I hadn't really considered before. You're right. Um, uh, it, it does make it difficult that if that hash or whatever that represents your fingerprint is stolen, you can't change your fingerprint. Uh, you know, it's not Yeah, and that's, that's the thing that, that scares me. If there was some way to make sure that that was always well protected, you know, yeah, my my hand, unless you cut my hand off like they do in the movies, the you know the bad guys cut the hand off and put it on the hand scanner. Um, yeah, that if you could protect that information, then you know proving that it's physically me is a good thing. But if you can steal that, however that's encoded, you know I can't change my fingerprint. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and at a certain point, you have to put a value on what's more valuable to me. You know, am I willing to have somebody cut off my finger in order to protect the contents of, I don't know, what's using biometrics? I mean, if it comes to something like a, as trivial as a Facebook account, you know, maybe I'd really rather just give them a password and have, instead of having them steal my finger off, you know? Yeah. Anyway. And, I mean, another thing is, is, I mean, it is a good point, but I think a lot of the times using human biometrics is also used in combination with, uh, some other authentication. So you'll have a password and your fingerprint. The password you could still change. I know some some places, uh, particularly government, are using three-factor authentication now where, you know, they have a password, they have a token, uh, like an RSA token, as well as a fingerprint or eye scan kind of uh, biometric type of thing. So, you know, the more it just makes – that is a big hassle when you got to keep logging in your system, sticking your eye into a machine or – type of passwords into it, all these various things. But it's the day and age we live in now. It's, it's, yep. it's kind of troubling that it's so easy for the bad guys to get our accounts and our passwords, and, you know, we need to do and come up with new ways to help better protect the systems that we access. Yeah. A good discussion. Oh, right. it's, a, it's an interesting report, though. Um, 
So it, folks might want to go out and grab it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I look forward to, you know, we should do another refresh on the kinds of password guessing we're seeing in our honeypots, because I thought that was interesting, too. Yeah, I, I'll try to do that analysis again um, sometime in the next few weeks, and we'll do it on a future show. Okay, great. So uh, moving on, let's uh, take a look at the Internet weather report. Um, there's not a whole lot of new stuff here uh, relative to previous weeks, but it's always good to, to take a, a look again. So the first one I have up here um, is, let me just make sure I'm on the first chart here, yep, um, is some increased scanning on various HTTP-based ports. And we talked about this a few weeks back, and I think Brian might have touched on it last week as well. Um, but there is a, a, a single source in China that's repeatedly scanning the same address block ranges, and he's doing the same ports over and over again. So I kind of made a nice rainbow chart here. And uh, one of the things that you can kind of see a pattern, well, first of all, there's the, a very pronounced pattern of how the, the scan fingerprint forms. You know, he's scanning the same address blocks over and over again in the same order. Um, but in addition, uh, there's various ports here. So I think this light pink might be port 8081, and then this aqua color is 8086 TCP, and then purple is 8088 and then dark green is 8089, and so forth and so on, 8090, 8888, so he keeps doing that. But what you can see here is uh, when we look at the pink starting, it goes pink, aqua, purple, dark green, light green, et cetera, et cetera, and you'll see that the sequence started again here right around the 26th, February 26th, where he's scanning pink, aqua, purple, dark green, so I would expect that this light green color, port 8090, is the next one that will probably hit within the next day or so that he's scanning. Uh, just an interesting thing. The, the goal, why, he's, why this individual or this um, uh, is scanning this, these particular address blocks could be to find uh, vulnerable systems that maybe there's certain web server type um, uh, administration control panels or other types of things that are on these ports. Could be proxy servers as well. We know that China stands a lot for open proxies. So various HTTP-based services that he's uh, uh, intent on trying to find and uh, get, a, get a complete list together on. It, I find it interesting that he keeps scanning the same stuff over and over again, um, I guess, maybe to find anything new that's emerged since the last time he scanned. And we haven't seen any evidence that he actually does anything with these after, after doing the scanning? So I haven't done a, a detailed look at what happens beyond the scanning activity uh, via this source, but that's something we could try to follow up on to see if, you know, once he does identify um, a live system uh, on one of these ports, does he try to engage it and kind of do some kind of brute force password guessing type things or whatnot? Or does um, he just collect it and then sell lists of machines that are, have this port open? Right, right. Um, it's not really clear what his goal is there. But. Hey, John, mm -hmm. looking at this, to me it appears like the initial spike is a significant amount of traffic, and then it sort of tapers off in smaller spikes after that. If I had to guess, this, the larger spike is the initial data set, and the smaller spikes after that is him trying to weed out items from that set. So maybe, he's, maybe the, 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 by the tail end he's found the boxes he wants, and that's that smaller section at the very end. No, I, I think it's actually an artifact of the, walk, the way he walks through the address space, and we have more visibility into the portions where we see the larger spikes. Right. Oh. And that's, Jim's exactly right. We, I did a study of this a couple of weeks ago. Um, you can go back and look at the show. But this, the very large spike at the top here is the 12.0.0.0 slash 8 address block, which is owned by AT&T. Um, and then this next spike is another AT&T address block and then another AT&T address block where we don't have as much address space. Um, so you literally see him walk through 0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.0 all the way up to 255, 255, 255, whatever. Um, and you can kind of get an idea of how much address space we have relative to each of those address blocks here um, and what depth we have across them. So it's kind of interesting because uh, he's literally scanning sequentially not even trying to randomize it in any way. Cool. So uh, it, that's an interesting fingerprint kind of situation that you see there based on the way he's doing his scanning. 
the next one that we have uh, is some increased scanning on 5901 TCP. Probably uh, the goal here is scanning for VNC. That normally 5900 is the normal port, but usually VNC servers will listen on a few ports. Uh, 5901 is the alternate one for like a secondary display if a second person comes in or uh, it's, it's another port that it can be, uh, it can listen on uh, to accept incoming connections. And um, we, we see scanning activity on this frequently. You get these little spikes here and there, but what we've noticed over the past uh, day or so that I wanted to bring attention to is that there is a source in France, primarily from this one IP address in France, that's really aggressively scanning um, for 5901 TCP. Um, so you can see it's a persistent type of um, uh, chunk of space that he's scanning here instead of little spikes here and there. Uh, so that's this. If you run VNC, you know, we always talk about if you are, why? Uh, if it's open to the Internet, uh, that's another big why. You should really lock down, especially any of these services like VNC, Remote Desktop Protocol, SSH, Telnet. I wouldn't even use Telnet. I don't know who should, who does anymore. But anything that uh, permits remote access to your um, systems, uh, lock it down to uh, only machines that need to connect to that from the Internet. So have some kind of filter on there. It could be IP tables. could be a firewall. Uh, just do something. Something is better than nothing, just having it out there exposed to the Internet at large. Or only allow it through a VPN or something, yeah. Right. That's even better. That's the best way, really, right? Um, port 9090 TCP. So we've had a couple of big spikes on this of scanning activity. Um, and I kind of took a look at this. I'm not quite sure exactly what the goal is here. Um, but we definitely have um, a few sources in China. Uh, they seem related. That's all I can really say. Not related to any of these previous ones, but the, the small number of sources are uh, within a address block. Uh, they're they're relative to each other, and they're pretty aggressively scanning 9090 TCP. So I did some research, and there's no no known or I shouldn't say there's no authoritative um, service associated with this port. Uh, however, uh, there are some uh, very software programs that do use it that are more notable than others. One in particular is OpenFire, uh, which is uh, their OpenFire administrative web interface is on this port, and that's a XMPP server, which is um, it's like a Jabber protocol type of server for uh, instant message communication type stuff. Um, I don't know a whole lot about it. I do know that there are some vulnerabilities in this software, particularly the administrative web interface. Uh, there are some bypass um, type vulnerabilities for older versions. So it could be that that's what they're searching for here. Um, when I say older, it's pretty old, like back to the like 2009 time frame. Uh, so I would hope that you've updated. Uh, but you never know. A lot of times people will scan for this stuff because people don't upgrade. Um, they just set it up and they never upgrade. So it could be that. Uh, there's another uh, software package called Manage Engine Applications Manager, which also runs on this port. There is a vulnerability for that one as well. It's also older. Uh, uh, this is a software package, by the way, that's kind of for management of your um, uh, of your system. So it's kind of like a I, I hesitate to say HP OpenView-ish kind of thing. It's not really exactly like that. It's more for managing your systems and making sure your applications stay alive and your websites and stuff like that. Um, so it could be related to that because there there's at least one known uh, vulnerability for this software package as well. Uh, so that might be the goal there. So if you're running any of those things or you have anything running on 99 TCP, um, you might want to be aware to has a heads up that someone's looking for things relative to that port lately. And then uh, here's our pie chart that we always go over. No big changes here. Uh, in fact, it's probably almost exactly the same as previous weeks. We have, uh, you know, the uh, weak file sharing type of exploits on 445 TCP. Config also uh, targets that. Um, we've got the zero access stuff on 16.464 and 16.471. That's the uh, zero access botnet uses a peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Uh, remote desktop protocol often targeted, uh, 3389 TCP as well as 22 TCP. Uh, this is probably not security relevant, the uh, uh, ICMP echo request. Um, 
that, that happens a lot on the Internet. There might be something relative to that, but um, it's usually showing up in our charts lately. But there's a lot of activity in general with that. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server, 1433. Telnet still scanned. A lot of times people are scanning for Telnet for your uh, kind of these little home Soho firewall routers and other devices like that. A lot of them still support Telnet. Um, so we've seen a lot of scanning relative to that um, uh, port for those types of devices, uh, just to be aware of. And again, we've talked about those in the past. If you have these embedded type of appliances, you might not really know what's going on with them. So if you have a, some way to get some visibility into the activity going uh, to them or from them, uh, that would be good to, to know about. And then uh, 5900 TCP VNC and 3306 uh, MySQL server um, also being scanned, and that could be for a variety of reasons. MySQL, they might be trying to break into the database. They could be looking for a known vulnerability relative to that software, et cetera. And then this chart is the most sources probing. So the last one uh, was based on the total number of scan probes. Uh, this is looking, instead of looking at a count of the number of probes, but the number of unique sources doing that and who's doing, you know, more activity uh, in terms of the number of uh, distinct unique source IP addresses. And uh, no big change here either. Uh, we got zero access, zero access. You can see a little bit more of the zero access stuff emerge because there's a lot of these bots out there, probably in the million range, I'm going to guess. But um, that's why they kind of show up in the most number of sources probing. Uh, so all these 16,400-ish uh, uh, ports are related to zero access bots trying to find each other out there on the Internet. And then uh, you've got your SMB um, uh, file sharing, you got your telnet again. Um, the, the ICMP stuff, probably not real security relevant. Uh, it could be. This may be. The 2816 ICMP is, uh, I looked this up last time and I can't remember what it is again, but. Um, to either a host unreachable or a port unreachable. It's one of those. That could be related to some types of UDP scanning or scanning that's going on where you get the ICMP back saying that that port's not open. Uh, so it could be an artifact of um, uh, sources or destinations on the Internet replying to scan probes um, that came into them from various sources. Right. And uh, RDP, uh, we see that all the time as well. It, uh, there's, you know, beyond just people scanning for RDP uh, in order to break in the machines uh, so that they can use them, there's also some worms out there, Mordo being one of them, I think I talked about maybe sometime last year, I set up a machine just as a test uh, with RDP, stuck it on the Internet, and within 15 minutes, Mordo had taken it over. I put a weak password on it, too, just intentionally, but it was Mordo came right in and took it over, uh, almost faster than I got a chance to instrument my monitoring on it. So, so that's our Internet weather. Uh, we have a new segment, or a relatively new segment, that we've been doing lately, and it's the top security concern of the week. So uh, I'll go to Jim first. Uh, what's the top security concern you've been thinking about uh, over the past week here? Yeah, one of the things that's, that I've been thinking about a lot, it's, you know, IPv6, we've been hearing it's coming for a decade or more, and we had the big IPv, world IPv6 day last summer. And my, my question is, you know, are enterprises – really ready for it even now. Um, you know, how well does your firewall handle IPv6 traffic? Are you, do you get net flow from IPv6 stuff? Um, I got to thinking about this, you know, uh, by working on some of my tools for analyzing you know, malware and trying to see if it's trying to communicate to command and control over IPv6. And then I got to thinking about um, my home system, and you know, I've got uh, IP tables. I've got a big rule set of IP tables for my IPv4 stuff, but my IPv6 stuff, my IP6 tables rule set isn't quite as big. And you know, I, I'm probably not the only one that that hasn't given as much thought to that. So that's my 
big thought for the week is, are we really ready for IPv6 as an industry? Yeah, I would agree. And not only are we ready in terms of collecting the log data and appropriate information relative to IPv6 like we already do with IPv4, uh, particularly in the security realm, uh, how well is your staff trained that's currently doing a lot of the security analysis in the nuances of IPv6? They're just understanding as well as they do IPv4. There's exactly. A bit you know, and how do you block a host, an IPv6 host, when most interfaces have more than one IPv6 address on them? Right. So, you know, to block a host, you're actually going to have to block maybe even in the slash 64. Um, yeah, just the, the kind of things that we know we've been doing IPv4 for so long, we understand that, but do we understand IPv6 as well? Right, I agree. Um, so, yeah, something for everybody to think about, and, and even us probably, um, even though we've been working in IPv6 uh, maybe a little bit more than some people have, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, still, I think there's a lot of ramp up that needs to be done there. So, uh, Matt. You have a top security concern for the week? I do, and it's been a concern of mine for a while. Um, day in and day out, I take a look at a lot of, of uh, malicious, a lot of malware samples, and what I'm finding more often than not is that the antivirus software that I use to scan against it, and in fact, most antivirus systems are still stuck in the, the um, signature-based detection world, where if you haven't seen this exact sample before, it throws up its hands and says, I really don't know what this is. Uh, and the problem with that is that the most, uh, maybe not even the most sophisticated of attackers, you know, garden variety uh, attacks that we see these days, I'll see the same exact software packed 100 to 200 different ways to create a completely unique sample, and yet I know, based on the behavior of it, it's the same thing underneath. It's just got a different coat of paint on the outside, and antivirus isn't going to catch it. So... Um, I, I, I hate to say it, but I feel like antivirus is really at risk of becoming completely irrelevant in a world where a signature means nothing at all. So I, I think that it's really – there are certain technologies out there that are behavior-based, and I really think it's time for them to shine, and I feel like that's really the way that AV is going to have to go in the near future if we're ever going to get this in, under control. Yeah, it's, it's something we've talked about before that, you know, we're playing kind of the catch-up game there. If it hasn't been seen before, then then you don't necessarily detect it. But, you know, the behavior-based is much harder to do well, and that's why it's been always been slower to, to come along. So, it, yeah, it's always an arms race, and you know, the folks on defense are always playing catch-up with the guys on offense. And, you know, uh, more so over the past, yeah, I'd say maybe three so years, um, there's really been a shift by these malware authors to uh, use these other services, not VirusTotal themselves, but VirusTotal-like services that allow them to test their malware against all of the AV vendors without the AV vendors actually getting a report on it. Uh, and it's these fully undetectable FUD services that are out there. So there's a lot of these malware authors that, you know, they've gotten smart. They said, well, I'll write it, you know, I'll compile it and try to make it hard to, you know, not match any signatures, but then I can test it to make sure it won't against, you know, 30 or whatever so antivirus vendors. And if it doesn't, you know, if it's detected by any of them or too many, they can recompile it, try it again, and, and get something that's really undetectable and then use that as their payload. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's really evolved malware in general from being a nuisance kind of, you know, kid kind of thing to a real business. You know, they've figured out the challenges and they've built infrastructure around, you know, making this a profitable business for them. So they want their stuff to be undetectable and they've figured out ways to do that nowadays. So, um, all right. So uh, I guess the, the last thing is uh, my security challenge or security concern of the week, I should say. And um, one thing I've been thinking about uh, recently is, you know, we've been aware over the past, I would say, the last fall that there's been a lot of DDoS attacks against the financial sector. 
Um, they have kind of started up again uh, as of this week. There's been some some uh, chatter or some rumblings that it was going to start up, and it has. Uh, so, you know, not to, uh, and the one thing I do want to um, uh, couch or whatever uh, contain the, the concern here is that things seem to be going pretty well in terms of DDoS mitigation, in my estimation. Uh, so I don't want to put people into a panic because that's not really um, uh, what we're here to do. It's just to make you aware that this is going on now, and uh, the current vendors out there who are providing DDoS mitigation seem to be doing a good job. The botnet is not as strong as it used to be. Uh, we've also gotten a lot savvier about how to, to uh, work against them. And um, what I would say uh, is an important item is if you are a web hosting provider, uh, particularly any of these large ones, and you're aware of this type of activity that's been going on, we know that a lot of the bots are compromised web servers. So keep an eye on your web, ser web servers that you have that you're hosting for customers, uh, particularly when they're you know, multi-homed customers and there's a lot of customers on there. It, whatever you can do to help uh, maintain and monitor for any kind of abuse activity related to this type of activity would really be helpful um, in terms of uh, helping squash, um, you know, this botnet from existing any further or propagating any larger than it already has. Right now it doesn't seem as large as it was one day, and uh, things seem to be pretty good. So, um, like I said, don't go into a panic. Just a heads up that it's happening again. Uh, you know, be observant and um, and uh, be watchful. Uh, make sure that you've got your your plans in place. That should something happen, you're ready to take action. Yeah, well, and you were talking about the hosting providers, but the folks who have their web servers hosted in these environments, you know, need to also be keeping track of their monitoring their web servers for uh, unauthorized changes. You know, I, I am the webmaster for my church's website, and so I set up a, a thing that you know is continually, periodically doing uh, MD5 hashes of all the files, just so I can be aware of if any of the files on my particular instance get modified, um, then I need to figure out how they got in and change them back. But yeah, so the the folks who have their web Host or their web servers hosted also need to be vigilant. Yep. Right, and it definitely helps. If you, even if you're not the direct target of somebody, you can be a platform for an attack on somebody else. You still have to be watchful. Yep. Yeah. All right, good discussion. Um, thanks, everybody, for that. And uh, that's our show for today. Uh, just a reminder, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at threattrack at list.att.com. And you can also find our program, or you can find us on Twitter uh, at, at ThreatTrack. So we have a Twitter feed there that you can check in and see, um, you know, what we're talking about. Uh, the ThreatTrack video is available at att.com slash ThreatTrack, and it's also available on YouTube. And you can subscribe to our audio-only feed via iTunes. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, thanks, uh, Jim and Matt, for uh, all your information and helping us out today. And uh, we'll be back next week with a new episode. Until then, keep your network safe.